Hello everyone and welcome to Full Circle Lithium's live event hosted by SIX. I'm pleased to introduce their speaker for today, CEO and Director Carlos Vicens. He will walk us through a presentation and after that we'll be accepting questions. You can submit your questions in the chat at any point during the presentation. As always, the summit is being recorded and will be available on SIX.com to watch afterwards. So without further ado, I'll hand things over to you, Carlos, to kick things off. So feel free to share your screen and we can get started here. Great. Uh, good morning or good afternoon, everybody. And thanks for joining us um, here to tell you a little bit about Full Circle Lithium and a summary of what we've been doing over the last, um, I would say, six months to a year. Um, so again, um, my name is Carlos Vicens. I'm the CEO, director and founder of Full Circle Lithium. Uh, I just want to give a little bit brief overview of you know, the team, or at least the, the key important people here. Uh, I've been in the capital markets for about 25 years now, um, as well as investment banking here in Canada. I've been involved in lithium since 2007, where we uh, raised money for the likes of Lithium Americas and, and other uh, companies uh, within the TSX market and the Lithium TSX market. And then I joined Neo Lithium in 2015, 2016, where we took that company public for roughly $60 million Canadian and then uh, sold it last year uh, for about a billion dollar Canadian. So good win for the team there. So that's me as, a, as an overview. Tom Curran, our CEO and also founder, has over 40 years of lithium chemical uh, experience. He's worked uh, in DuPont and Livent, uh, two key companies in the lithium space here in, in the US or in North America. He has worked for all the federal labs that, that you can imagine. Uh, he's one of the key persons that uh, that we have in the company and uh, one of the original lithium experts um, back in the 80s, 90s here in, in the North America. Paul Fornazari, our executive chairman, he has uh, he runs a well, he works as a lawyer at a global law company here in um, in Canada called Faskins. He has also been uh, founder of several lithium stories, including Lithium Americas, Neolithium with me as well, and this one now, Full Circle Lithium. So significant experience both in the capital markets as well as uh, the operational expertise. And these are just the top three. We obviously have a team that, um, that we share here that works uh, directly in Georgia, as well as in California, helping us uh, move the project forward. So, to tell you a little about Full Circle in terms of how we um, see ourselves, we got four pillars. If you have a, you know, a table, we got these four um, legs of the stool, as we call them. We have US-based operations, obviously a, a significant um, place to work, uh, as well as a fully operational plant in the state of Georgia in the US, <clears throat> very close to the state of Florida. Um, this plant has is fully permitted and uh, was a firm, uh, past producer. Uh, we also have proven processing and a green footprint, meaning that we have a diversified feedstock portfolio. This is not a science experiment. Uh, the majority, if not all, of the of the products that we're currently developing and moving forward uh, have been already tested both on in lab uh, and now operationally at the client site. So we understand well what we're trying to do and how we're trying to approach it. Uh, in fact, we've already installed um, a modular processing plan at a client site, and we're starting larger demonstrations of all of our businesses. And we've created, we have a, a patent portfolio, as well as a new product on the full, um, on the fire suppressant solution as well that is uh, patent pending. In terms of the market dynamics, um, these uh, are obviously uh, very good on the, um, the green market uh, and the mobility. Uh, for lithium ion batteries, uh, this this pro this uh, industry is expected to grow significantly over the next few years, and we're right in the middle of it. Um, the government of Georgia is expected to spend anywhere between ten and twenty billion dollars of of money within just the state of Georgia, and that's just uh, in the state, but regionally, over forty billion is going to be spent and invested. So we're sitting right in the middle of that. And we all hopefully expect to um, to be a um, a player within that market and, and grab some of that market share. And in terms of the team, like I mentioned before, over 70 years of combined lithium operational experience as well as capital markets, which is important. You know, you not only need to have 
the operational, the capital markets, but a combination of both. And we have very good support for, from the state of Georgia, um, as I mentioned, in terms of the investments and um, the way they're supporting us within um, the, the community as well as uh, statewide. Now, in this next slide, uh, blank for now, I'm going to explain how our business works uh, over the next, uh, just a bit more graphically for you to understand how we're going about building our business. So we call, we separate our business in downstream and upstream. On the downstream side, as you can see in that green factory there, that's our lithium processing plant in the state of Georgia. That's a permitted former producer. It was producing uh, in the late uh, 2010, 2011. It was mothballed in 2012 uh, for the lithium pricing at the time. And now we brought it up to speed, refurbished it, and is now currently uh, ready to produce. It has a capacity of around 2,000 tons of lithium carbon equivalent per year. But uh, just with the infrastructure that we have, that can get expanded fivefold, meaning it could go up to about 10,000. And just to give you an idea what that means, what is 2,000 tons on a revenue only basis? That doesn't mean gross margins or anything. 2,000 tons at, let's say, 20, 25,000 or 30,000, what, what the price of uh, lithium carbonate is on a per ton basis, that goes anywhere between 40 and 60 million a year of revenue on the current capacity that we have. That doesn't mean that we're going to produce that revenue over the very short term, but that's the capacity of the plant today. Now, we have that plant, but we need to feed that plant in order to make money. And what are the three diversified business uh, downstream businesses that uh, we are um, developing? The first one is our feedstock recycling or midstream uh, recycling. That entails us uh, going into industrial and chemical companies that have that utilize lithium uh, in any form that have a stream with a waste that contains lithium. And then we go there, we installed a lithium extraction plant or a what p other people call a DLE or direct lithium extraction. And we extract the lithium within the solution. And we can do two things at that point. If the client needs the lithium back in their processing, we can sell it back to them, meaning that we don't have to ship any of the product outside of their facility. Remember, we build this plant at their facility. If the client does not need it or doesn't need all of it, we can ship it to our plant in the state of Georgia and then produce lithium carbonate or other products that we can then sell to the market. That's the first line of product. The next one is the lithium uh, ion battery recycling. As the name entails, this is where we recycle lithium ion batteries um, and we do all of that process within the, uh, our plant in Georgia. Uh, we are establishing certain partnerships, hopefully over the next uh, little while, in order to, um, I would say, logistically try to grab all the batteries that are regionally accessible to us, as well as nationwide. So those, those are some of the things that we're working for. But within that lithium-ion battery, there's also a fire suppressant solution that we'll explain later. On the third upstream feedstock uh, business that we have, we call the lithium refinery. This is where we go and apply our direct lithium extraction technology or our lithium extraction uh, processing knowledge. And we go to mines and or upstream mining assets that need some help in the refining and or processing of the lithium from raw form into a final product that can get sold into the market. All three are very different in terms of capital exposure, risk associated and margins, um, uh, but definitely all three would go a long way in terms of developing our company into what we call a robust, uh, you know, a diversified revenue uh, business that we're able to, I would say, manage ourselves within the environment that we're currently in. So if, for example, the lithium batteries are not there, we can focus more on the battery side and the midstream recycling or the lithium refinery, or hence, you know, we can change businesses and have a more diversified way of looking at it. The majority of our competitors are just focused on one or potentially two. None of them are focused on all three. Um, so 
Within that, let me go into the next slide and show you a little bit more pictures in terms of what we're trying to do and our operations. Like I mentioned to you, here are some pictures to the right where you can see the entrance to our plant. Uh, the middle picture there gives you a sense of what a lithium extraction plant is. Um, that is what was installed in our first client. And it's currently, uh, we currently put out a press release that our first demo processing plant has proven to recover 99% of all lithium within the waste stream. That's the um, the type of facility that it is, that that we're installing now. Granted, it has changed a little bit to that, but this is a small, uh, I would say, demo plant. Uh, without the tanks on both sides, this demo plant is around 20 by 20 feet. So this is high, and the way we build it, we build it scalable. So this demo plant. Today, the capacity has, has about 250 tons per annum. The client needs anywhere between 500 and 1,000 as they grow. So in order for us to expand this plant, it's quite easy. It's not that we need to take it out and then ship another one much larger. This is something that uh, it's easily scalable. And uh, that's how we plan to build these, um, these lithium extraction plants. Um, and on the bottom, you see some of the batteries that we're currently sourcing, and uh, we now have about 5,000 gallons of, uh, of solution that we will most likely start uh, processing in our lithium carbonate plant over the year end into next year in order to start um, processing, I mean, uh, producing lithium carbonate and then selling to the market. Here, uh, I have not talked too much about our fire suppressant solution, but within it's within the, li the lithium ion battery recycling. I'll explain a little bit more of that over the next uh, few slides. Um, more pictures here for you to get a sense of what, what uh, the plant looks like. Um, you see the, uh, the drawing on the top left where you see how we've expanded some of the process building as well as the lab addition and office and so forth and the, and the parking and the tractor trailer parking area. The bottom two left pictures, you see the office as well as the plant. And then on the right, you'll see some of the past um, producing, uh, past uh, lithium carbonate um, production that was done at the plant on those super sacks there. Each of those sacks is about a ton of lithium carbonate. So we have about four tons of lithium carbonate there. But uh, the video that I'm going about to show you is our filter press that's coming out of our, those some of the tests that we're doing our filter press and lithium carbonate. That's, uh, that is lithium carbonate that has uh, obviously some moisture on it, but that after that's moisture, it gets put in a hopper and then into a dryer that you see here uh, and that dryer then obviously um, after it's dried, of course, that's, that's when you put into super sacks and then sold to the market. The bottom right picture gives you a sense of how big that 2000 ton per annum uh, lithium carbonate plant looks like. Again, uh, our way of, um, of building anything that we're trying to do, it has to be scalable as well as modular. We don't want to build a large plant and or facility that is underutilized and put a lot of capital work uh, before we have enough feedstock to operate it. So this plant right here is for 2000 tons. All that is missing and you can't see it to the right would be the dryer, but um, it gives you a sense of, um, of sizing. Th there again, we can fit within that building uh, an expansion of up to 10,000 tons or 5x what we currently have. Now I'm going to talk to you a little bit about the two, I would say, most exciting uh, business. It doesn't mean that's the only business that we're only focusing on, but two exciting um, parts of the business that we put out some press releases to the market. Um, the first one is the midstream feedstock recycling business. This is the one that we focus on chemical and manufacturing companies um, and have waste material that contains lithium. Uh, we've put out quite a bit of uh, news releases here, and um, we're excited about this business because this is the business that's going to provide us, the, we believe, our first revenue and cash flow to the company. In fact, we envision, um, you know, subject to final agreement uh, with the client and uh, final, uh, I would say, definitive agreement with them is that we'll start generating revenue Q1 of next year, which is um, pretty, I would say, um, important for us 
as well as you know you don't you don't see many companies that uh, go public and and uh, and are already generating revenue within the lithium space uh, in less than a year. So we're focusing all our team is focused on on that. Uh, specific on this first client. And you can see some of the pictures here when we ship that uh, processing plant to the client site. Again, uh, that has changed a little bit in terms of um, how we're working with some of the recovery and impurities. For example, we've we've put out some uh, pre-cleaning or uh, pre-filtration system before the lithium extraction or um, the LE uh, processing plant. And then once we recover the lithium, we've also put additional filtration systems to uh, meet all uh, the impurity uh, targets for the final product to the client. The latest press release that we put out um, last week was that we've met, we've now we're extracting over 99% of all the lithium within solution, which is uh, something that is um, very, very difficult to do. So uh, obviously our, Technology works very well uh, within the client's premise, is working very well within the client's premises. And not only that, which is important to extract the lithium, we've been able to meet the impurity targets that were very strict. Unfortunately, we can't really talk too much in detail in terms of those impurities and, and what uh, the level is because of um, you know NDA um, uh, agreements with the client. But uh, suffice to say, uh, we're on the right track. So that's on the midstream recycling business. Again, mm -hmm. what we're trying to do there next is uh, now ramp um, the, I would say the capacity of that demo plant uh, to a more uh, of, of up to 200 to 250 tons per annum on a full run rate basis. And once we do that and process about 20 or 30,000 gallons for the client, uh, of uh, lithium chloride, then we'll be well on our way to signing that final agreement, uh, building the final uh, commercial modular commercial production plant, uh, and uh, producing our first revenue early next year. So that's exciting for all of us, and we're focused one hundred percent on that one. Now, the next one that we put out some press releases on, and we're very excited about, is what we call our fire suppressant solution. Um, which we believe is going to be a potential game changer within the lithium ion battery um, world. As you know, um, we did not come out when we went public. This was not one of the products that we were essentially uh, focusing on because we didn't even know we had it. And let me explain how, you know, how that worked. So when we started receiving lithium ion batteries, uh, we believe that the best way to disassemble the batteries was uh, doing it on a fully charged basis. And, you know, I can't go, I can't go too much in detail. Though. There's a lot of IP surrounding why we believe that's the best case in order to recover the majority of the lithium within the cells. But some of these videos are going to give you a better idea of what we're trying to do. So the first one um, is just a lithium ion battery cell. Uh, when you open these cells, as you can see, catches on fire. This is a fully charged cell, and you can see how it catches fire there in the video. Uh, and that's just all the chemicals um, reacting with with the air, the oxygen. So you can say, so essentially, if you don't take that battery apart in a solution that is safe, it will catch on fire. So knowing that, we've created a solution, and you can see on the second video where once you open the lithium ion battery. Uh, cell, uh, there is absolutely no reaction. You can see the reactions there within the liquid, but there is no fire. So you can see all the hydrogen release and all that. And I'm going to just, you know, uh, not talk too much here, but uh, as you can see, this there's absolutely zero reaction in terms of um, uh, fire or potential hazardous um, fumes within the um, the environment. Right now, of course, this is a this was done a while back uh, manually, but you also have to do this manually to understand what's happening. There are certain automation th um, that we're working on right now in order to automate some of these processes that were not fully finalized, but. We've done over 500 of these demonstrations, in fact, now more without incidents uh, quite quickly and cost effectively. So we believe that this process will be 
um, I would say optimal for what we're trying to accomplish. And this last one here is how we take all the batteries apart. You can see how um, you know, we take um, some of the separators, which is that white film that you see there. And then you see the aluminum and the copper sheets coming out and all the other, so, um, I would say cathode slash uh, anode parts of the battery also coming out of those black um, spots that you see there on the liquid. But the important thing here is the safety uh, of that liquid. And once we saw this, we decided, we decided, no, we, we obviously said, well, there has to be another type of um, use for this uh, liquid, which is fires uh, that are happening currently in the lithium ion battery uh, industry. Now, what are those fires? Well, these are some of them. I mean, there's not, not to be al alarmist by any stretch of the imagination. Not all batteries are going to catch on fire, of course, and not all cars, but there are certain fires. And the MO, or modus operandi, of, of the majority uh, of the um, uh, first responders is to let it burn or to throw quite a bit of water. When I'm talking quite a bit of water, when a fire, when a car starts burning, this is over 20,000 gallons of water with just to one car uh, or 2,000 gallons uh, of water in two cars. And that's just simply not a solution. And then after you do that, you let it sit there for two to three weeks to see if it starts burning again. So not only do you have to put the fire out, but you have to keep it out. And our fire suppression solution does just that. So what are we doing right now with the FSS is that we're going to a third party testing. We've done some testing within our facility. We believe it does work, but you need to uh, have some credible third party facility validate those results that we've done internally. So the first test that we've done, as you can see, is some cylinder batteries there. These are a bit bigger than the, the AA batteries. Uh, so not enormous batteries. Uh, these are not large set batteries, but uh, it gives you an idea of what we're trying to do. This is, this is the first test. The second test, and I'll show you the video of that test. The second test will be for scooters uh, and or e-bikes. And then the third test hopefully uh, will also, not hopefully, will be with uh, an EV uh, battery or car. And uh, that most likely happen over the next hopefully a few weeks, we're waiting on a, a timetable from that same uh, third party facility. So here's the test that we've done. So as you can see, we put the batteries on fire, a controlled fire, and these are all, these, all those cables that are surrounding are measuring heat. The heat that, this, um, that these batteries uh, have right now is over a thousand centigrades uh, of um, of heat that they have, and you can see how it's a chain reaction. Once one burns, then it catches another one, then another one, and you can see how they catch. And right now, they, as you can you saw there, that's our solution that sprayed the batteries and took the fire out, and and basically less than a quart of uh or less you know less than half a liter around a half a liter of solution not only did it put the fire out but it lowered the temperature from over a thousand to 40 degrees centigrade which is what you need to stop the um the fire from burning again so uh it's a chemical reaction um and it's not just water it is a um a diluted it's 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 a it's a solution that contains water, but it, it has other chemicals uh, within that solution that um, has some of the that chemical reaction that uh, helps the fire not only put the fire out with the water, but also keep it out with the chemical reaction. So that tells you a bit about the what we're trying to accomplish there, and this is a little bit of what our story was in in terms of where we were and where we are. Um, and where we want to be, we this this plant has been operating since the mid '90s. About five million dollars of investment have gone in it. Um, last year, we've raised five million Canadian privately to refurbish the battery and the facilities to be ready to start uh, to develop some of these products that I've just talked to you about. We went public in May and raised an additional ten million in order to develop those product lines um, and 
be in commercial production with no additional funds by hopefully Q1 of next year on the recycling business, which is the midstream feedstock recycling, potentially the lib recycling. And we're continuing to focus on uh, business development to create even more client base. Not only that, we create an additional uh, business opportunity with the fire suppressant solution, which was not, um, I would say, was a happy coincidence that we've created it, but it was not in our original plan. So depending on how we plan, how we are going to develop that product, which most likely will be uh, with a, a partner or some sort of partnership as uh, going forward, once we de-risk some of these tests that we're working through, um, that would alleviate some of the capital constraints that we may have uh, to develop that uh, and go in public. But that's where we are right now. Um, we are going to be uh, ready to start um, providing some of that news releases, both on the fire suppressant solution and also on the midstream recycling over the next few months. So uh, stay tuned for that. In terms of the capital structure, quite easy. Uh, we have about 68 million shares outstanding today, fully diluted about 82 million. Our share price, this was as of October 24th of last week, about 66 cents. I remind everybody that we went public at 70 cents. Uh, we are down a little bit, but um, you know, the, the market has been down since we went public over 50% in our, in our line of business. Uh, so we've been uh, somewhat, um, uh, we've done well uh, in comparison to others. That doesn't mean that we're happy with where we are. Uh, that doesn't mean that I'm happy where, where we are. Uh, and uh, hopefully going forward with some of the news releases that we're going to have would be much higher than that. Uh, so we're working working hard to, to make sure that our share price not only maintains but also goes up. Our market cap today is about 45 million Canadian. We have about 6 million Canadian today in the bank, which again is sufficient for us to go to start our gener the revenue generation uh, in Q1 of next year. And depending on growth profiles of, of the different uh, product lines, we'll see where we go from there. But uh, we we don't need any cash right now, no, we need, uh, so we're fully funded. Our insider ownership is about a third of the company, 32%. Um, um, I'm personally the largest uh, personal shareholder of the company with around nine to 10 percent. So we're we're fully aligned, including myself, with all the shareholders, uh, and uh, we expect to keep it that way. Um, and that essentially tells the story in terms of where what I wanted to to give you an update. Uh, what I, you know, just to, as a summary. Um, I wanted to uh, let everybody know that over the next little while, we're going to be focusing on our midstream recycling. Again, that's going to provide some news over the next few weeks and months. Once we process our 20 to 30,000 gallons within the client, we'll hopefully sign that uh, definitive agreement and start uh, the uh, the build out of the commercial plant, which is essentially retrofitting the same demo plant that's currently at the client site, and that should be done by early Q1 of next year. We're gonna provide additional news on other clients that we're working with right now uh, and sign some NDAs. And we're gonna provide some uh, news on the, uh, the fire suppressant solution and what we're doing there with some of the other testing, as well as potential partnerships there. And we're also working on our lithium refinery business with other potential clients that uh, we're hopeful that we can also start um, uh, delivering some results, not short term, but more medium term over the next, I would say, six months to 12 months plus. Uh, but definitely, if you start building those clients and uh, I would say that uh, potential revenue portfolio uh, in the back end, then you're going to start seeing results uh, over the short, medium and long term, which is what we want. And that's all I wanted to say uh, today. And uh, hopefully you have some questions and I'm happy to answer anything that you, you need. Perfect, thank you, Carlos. Uh, just a reminder for everyone that tuned in and if you turn, tuned in a little late that we are accepting questions in the bottom right hand side in the chat. So feel free to continue to ask. We did have some questions submitted via email. So I'll start with those before I address the chat questions. Uh, first question. How big is your Georgia-based plant? How many tons of annual production can it produce? 
Our, our plant uh, right now, as it stands, is 2,000 tons for, of lithium carbon equivalent per year. Um, that's what it, it is able to produce today. But again, um, that plant can only function well if we have enough feedstock that provides it, that is, is able to keep that fully, um, I would say, utilized. What we're trying to do with the three distinct business is or um, or feedstock business a diversified portfolio business is that uh, we're, we're hopefully able to provide enough feed not only to uh, meet that 2,000 tons but exceed it over the you know the medium term uh, as well as one of the things that we're trying to do is build satellite um, processing plants at client site. So even though we have 2000 tons of production capacity at the plant, uh, we're building pro processing capacity at the client site as well. Uh, so this first client that we're currently working with, if things go well, which we, we believe they will, we'll have at least by Q1 of next year, an additional 500 tons of capacity there. So not only do we have that capacity at the plant, but we also have capacity outside of the plant. Thank you. And this individual has uh, multiple questions. So our first, I would just go through them in order. First question, I've been following the company since the IPO in May. How far along is the first midstream commercial project in terms of finalizing a contract? Um, we're, we're basically at the critical uh, juncture where we've met the recovery uh, that we said we we're going to do and we met the, uh, the impurity levels that we said we we're going to meet. So now we have a product that meets all the requirements from the client and now we need to produce 20 to 30,000 gallons to them that meet those requirements, which that can be produced in less than a week. That tells you a little bit something about how much that plant can produce. But once we do that, then we start looking at the definitive agreement, which by the way, we already have a draft and everything. It's not like we, we haven't even thought about how the, the definitive agreement looks like. And then uh, once we have that signed, then um, we, we and, by, and by the way, we're already working on the commercial plant layout and how that's gonna work. So it's not like we're gonna wait until we do all this to move forward with a commercial plant. We already know that that's, we're gonna meet all those standards. So hopefully we'll get to that soon. soon. Thank you. And follow up question. How large is the midstream market in the US? And maybe I'll just follow up on that. Are you solely going to be focused on US? Do you ever have plans of expanding internationally? Um, it, it, that question is, is a bit difficult to answer um, because of the fact that there are multiple industrial and chemical companies that we don't really understand how efficient they are. What we can see it is around 5,000 tons within the North American only market. We're now working with a client that does have offices in the US, but it's a European company. So, you know, Europe could add another, I would say, couple thousand tons potentially. So, I would say the market right now that we can see that we have, um, I would say, numbers on that we can credibly defend would be anywhere between five and 7,000 tons. But just to give you an understanding of the economics, um, this first client that we're working with, uh, and this is just 500 tons of lithium carbon equivalent uh, potential, we can make approximately at full run rate, depending on lithium pricing, right? Because lithium pricing changes uh, you know, quarterly in terms of contract basis, we're, we could make anywhere between seven to 10 million of EBITDA US on 500 tons. Now, that's not an extrapolation to all the 5,000 tons because each client is different in terms of cost of capital, operating expenses, and so forth. But even if you take a very conservative view of for every 1,000 tons, it's about 10 million of EBITDA, you get a sense of how large the market is, not only on a volume basis, but also on a potential for EBITDA slash revenue basis. So it is a significant market uh, for us. And it's a market that we we believe we can capture quite easily. 
Uh, it's not competitive in terms of nobody's really focusing on that. A lot of the companies that work on the direct lithium extraction and or uh, processing are focused more on larger products, uh, sorry, larger clients and larger uh, projects uh, around, you know, 10, you know, in the thousands of tons. And we believe that these projects can generate significant amount of returns uh, and uh, are going to need a lot less capital. Uh, and uh, so that's what we're working on. Thank you. The next individual that wrote in uh, is wondering if there's any coverage on the company from a research perspective. Yeah, as of today, we have uh, one uh, research analyst, uh, and that's Claris. Um, and um, that's the only one we have for now. We are working uh, with other banks at the moment, and hopefully we have more coverage. But as of today, we only have one research coverage, and Clara Securities is the one that provides that. Great. Uh, I'm going to rephrase this question a little bit because if you've been paying attention to the news, you do know that lithium fires are rather common, and this fire suppressant solution has great potential. There's a demand for it. I'm just wondering what's the competition like in the market right now? And uh, are you rather first mover advantage on this? On this yeah, market? I mean, we, we don't see a lot of competition period in the market. The competition is water, um, which is not real competition. There are certain companies that say they have uh, a product that can potentially put out lithium ion based fat, lithium ion battery fires, but not to the extent and not to the level that our product can. Uh, in fact, uh, we don't believe that the results they post are necessarily correct in what they're trying to do. They haven't been verified uh, like we're trying to verify them. So we believe that once we have all these tests, again, we still need to go through that third party testing and verify our results uh, that we've uh, we've achieved at our site, but uh, I think we have a pretty good um, first mover advantage here, and um, you know we we can potentially work in many different ways. So we see the market, we can cut the market in many ways. You have you know you have the residential market, you have um, the commercial market, and then you have the industrial market. And the commercial, the, the residential market is essentially you buying, going to Home Depot or Lowe's or any of these hardware companies and buying your fire suppressant solution there. This could be five, 10 uh, gallon uh, uh, a fire suppressant uh, solution there. Uh, and then you can use that at home if you have a potential fire and, and any, you know, it could be a bike, it could be your lawnmower, it could be your, your scooter, or it could be your computer. And you can have that in the kitchen, you can have that uh, in the garage or so forth. But then you have um, the industrial and commercial side where the sizes are enormous, right? Uh, so we're trying to work uh, both on the private side, but also on the government side within the DOE. And with DOE is the Department of Energy uh, and the Department of Transportation, the DOD in the US, where they, they're essentially today building a, an enormous, um, uh, uh, we call this um, charging station uh, infrastructure within the U.S. And that is where, where whenever there's a battery charging is where the potential of fires is greater. So, you know, if all goes well, we could potentially have our fire suppressant solution within that um, battery, uh, battery charging station network uh, being built and so forth. So the, the commercial side is enormous and the industrial side could be uh, where OEM slash uh, battery manufacturers have sprinkler systems that the solution goes out and puts out fires. So it is a very large, um, I would say industry still to be developed, still to be determined how we're going to play within the market and how we're going to address all those markets. But, um, you know, we we are a small company. Uh, we are running many different fronts. We have many different products. So the most likely scenario for us would be to partner with a much larger company that can provide us that, uh, I would say, faster uh, entry into the market in a more holistic way.
Thank you, Carlos. I just want to piggyback off that about this fire suppressant market and you I'm rephrasing a little, but you said pretty much that it was a lack of verification from competitors. Is there like a gold standard uh, organization that verifies this technology for retail investors looking at at potential companies to invest in? Is there like, how do we look at the people verifying such technology? Well, that's a very good question. And there really isn't one. And th this is why I say there really isn't one. I'm going to stop sharing so I can, I can see a little bit uh, what I'm speaking with. But uh, so the, when, you, when you buy a fire suppressant, you buy letters, so like A letter A, B, C, and so forth. And there's about five different types of fire suppressants which you can buy depending on the fire that you need, right? So if you're putting out a fire that is oil versus wood or, or whatever it is, you, you're going to have to have a different type of fire suppressant for that. And there isn't one for lithium because lithium has a variety of these letter numbers. Uh, so we believe that it's going to take a while for any government institution to say, okay, this fire suppressant is going to be very, it's going to work for lithium ion battery fires. So it might be letter L uh, in the future. Right. Hello? Hi, Carlos. I think uh, we just lost you for a second there. <laughs> oh, what happened? What I heard was letter L, and then um, I don't know if it was yeah. me or the whole audience, but I lost you at, at letter L. You said it might yeah, be Yeah, no, I think, it I think it was me. I don't know what happened here. I just got disconnected um, for some reason, but I'm back. So, yeah, so there isn't a standard for lithium ion batteries fires today that people can go look and say, okay, these are the 10 fire suppressant solutions that are in the market for lithium. Uh, and and this is who's um, because it has to be a rating, and not only that, but it has to be verified by a third party facility. For example, UL would be one, and others that have tested the product in different situations and verified that the product works. So that's why we went through a third party tester. But even after you do that, um, your fire suppression solution has to be uh, validated to which letter uh, that fire suppression solution works. Uh, and as of today, uh, unfortunately, uh, there isn't one for just lithium ion batteries. There's one for different types of other of, of, of fires and not necessarily for lithium ion batteries. Uh, but um, we are working very hard, not only privately, but also with the government officials to hopefully speed that process through. And even if we get a category AB for a fire suppression solution, we can still uh, work with that within the industry. And then as that verification and or government entities provide that, uh, I would say, uh, knowledge to the market so people can really see what's out there, then that's where we get recategorized into that solution as well. Thank you. Appreciate that. We better get into the chat questions now, because um, okay. we do have quite a few. So first one by P.T. Harris. Is there ongoing research to further improve the LEP tech and what can we expect in terms of that? Um, that's on the LEP, like the lithium extraction process. Did I understand correctly? Yes. If there's any further refinements to that? Mm -hmm. is that, is that the question? Yeah, ongoing research. Yeah, yeah all the time. Uh, pre post um, filtration systems within that same within our same LEP our uh, experts are working on always trying to be more efficient. So yeah, we're extracting lithium from solution, uh, but there are many different types of solutions, right? This is the solution that we're now working with is a relatively clean solution. Nevertheless, it has certain you know, uh, impurities that we need to take out and the client needs this 
to be a very, very, very clean lithium chloride solution. This is not a, a typical solution that a lot of people would uh, deal with. So each client is going to be different. Uh, but as, as I alluded to, when you look at direct lithium extraction, this could be applied to many other different types of, of uh, lithium bearing solutions, i.e. raw material bearing solutions for the mines within the U.S. or even South America. Can we apply our, um, our technology into that? Yes, potentially. Have we done some testing? Yes. Are we doing tests? Yes. So we are developing a lot of these uh, ongoing, um, I would say, testings on different types of solutions that will hopefully evolve into more, I would say, revenue potential for us and also other uh, revenue generation avenues that we're not even counting today. So, But there's definitely, uh, we're trying to improve on every day there in terms of how we process uh, lithium. Great. Appreciate that. And he has a follow-up question here in regards to the FCL demo, demo plant. Just wondering about the potential revenue streams from it once it reaches commercial scale. Yeah, I think I alluded to that earlier, but um, as it stands right now, this um, the demo plant per se is 250 tons. Most likely what will happen, the way I envision is that the demo plant will be our production plant, and then we'll, it will you know, we'll add capacity uh, to that demo plant, which is currently at 250, to get to that 500 tons that the client needs on a full run rate basis. Uh, so, but when we look at a full run rate basis of 500 tons per annum and we're fully operating for a year, uh, we believe, and this is with pricing as of today, we believe that that plant can generate anywhere between seven and $10 million of EBITDA uh, per year on a full run rate basis after a year. That doesn't mean that's going to happen January 1st of next year, but you know, after a year, that's what we can, we can, uh, we can work for. So, um, it's a significant amount of revenue for our first client. Uh, that same client has already told us that they want to expand and double their uh, their production over the next 12 months. In fact, they're already expanding their plant, but it takes longer for them to expand than for us. So we envision that once they expand, all we need to add is a, you know a couple more filters, a couple more tanks, and so forth. For us, it's easy to expand. So we're just waiting for them to tell us uh, on that expansion. But the main that they're currently producing now, which is 500 tons, that can generate anywhere between five and ten million dollars. Thank you. I'm going to just read Keith's question verbatim here. Five thousand gallons of recycled battery goo. You said you could also be in revenue for the late 2023, early 2024. What kind of volume per day slash month, et cetera, do you need to break even on that? I would say that, gener I mean, we could potentially, we could be in revenue generation by early next year as well on the battery side, but not significant, not to a level that I would say uh, it's going to be constant, that I can point my finger and say, this is going to be something that's going to happen month in and month out. The reason, reason being is our battery recycling business I would call, has three types of, um, I would say, types of batteries. End of life battery, one. Um, out of spec battery, two. And then out of spec cathode material, three. Uh, and those are three distinct types of uh, processing opportunities there. Obviously, two, two of them are batteries that you have to dismantle and so forth. But the other one is more, um, you know, I would say easier. You don't have you don't have all the extra carcass that surrounds the battery that you need to take out, which is more expensive. Um, I believe that once we get and I always see this on a lithium carbon equivalent basis more than anything, because a lot of the battery recyclers look at it on a um, on a per ton basis of battery. And uh, it just depends what type of battery you're getting, what size, I mean, you know, and, and so forth. So I see it more on a lithium carbon equivalent basis. And I look at it on a 250 ton lithium carbon equivalent basis. Once we get there, we're going to start generating um, gross margins that are going to be in excess of our cost. Because there is significant costs associated with automating and building and the people that need to operate this. So that would mean that we need to get to that level. And that level will be end of next year or mid to late next year, in my mind, uh, to start generating revenues that are going to be, that have going to be margins. Let me put it that way. 
Going back to the fire suppressant technology, Eric brings up an interesting point. He's wondering about the toxicity of the solution, any hazmat handling requirements, et cetera. Zero. So this is a solution that you can put, you can uh, touch with your hand, no issues whatsoever. So uh, the toxicity comes from the battery itself, not from our solution that puts out the fire. So in fact, our solution minimizes the toxicity of the battery when it catches on fire because it stops it from spreading. So it is, uh, it is a benefit. And I'm not, I can't say too much about this next level, but our fire suppressant solution comes out of our battery recycling business. So whatever goes into that solution comes out of the battery recycling. So this is a full circle. So very you know environmentally friendly, not only that, but we're not buying new chemical products within you know the industry and so forth and putting the solution and, and this is There. Not only, uh, so again, let me repeat myself. So once we extract some of this, these, uh, these chemicals from the batteries or products from the batteries, that's where we build a fire suppressant solution. So it's a full circle like our name has, um, and it's as very environmental friendly. So no uh, environmental uh, issues there in terms of our fire suppressant solution. Thank you. Eric has um, a follow-up with multiple questions and I'm just gonna read it verbatim and you can take it how you will. Professor Pohl at Purdue is develop, developing electrolyte that incorporates fire retardation within the battery. If this becomes standard practice, what does this imply for the marketability of your solution? And regarding what specifically have you patented the use case or the solution chemistry? Yeah, well, I mean, th that is obviously better benefic beneficial. I mean, there's always going to be different types of uh, uh, of batteries, and the batteries are going to evolve. They're going to get better. Uh, but for that product to get into the market, it's going to take quite a bit of long time. You still have significant amount of batteries today in the market that don't have that, that are still, I would say, uh, in their infant stages of developing. And you're going to have different types of batteries, different types of category of batteries. I don't know how much. Uh, that fire ret retardant capacity is going to cost within the battery and so forth. So some batteries will have it, some batteries will not have it. And you still have significant batteries coming from abroad uh, that may not have that. Uh, for example, your your, uh, your computers, your your phones, your batteries for your uh, you know your lawnmower or whatever that is. So there is significant um, use today. I agree that there has to be a reactive approach, which is ours, meaning the fire happened and you need to put it out, right? Uh, but there's also have to be a proactive approach to minimize fires, which is what this professor is trying to do, which I applaud, and that's that's very beneficial. But fires will always happen, even if there is, for, this, for example, there's a crash, there is a puncture in the battery, fires can still happen at that point, and you need to put those fires out, uh, and that's where a fire suppressor solution can still be effective. Looks like there's a lot of interest in this tech. We got a couple more for this fire suppressant solution. Uh, David's asking, will you be installing a solvent extraction system to accentuate or work in unison with your FSS? Um, we're thinking about that. Uh, that's not necessarily something that we're currently working on, but there's a lot of avenues that we, we can enhance our product portfolio. So the short answer is yes, but we're still in development of our, um, of our main fire suppressant solution. And this could kind of going back to the verification process. Eric's wondering on his third part question, who are you working with uh, for incorporating the technology into a fire into the fire suppressant industry standard? Um, you mean on the third party validator? I, I believe so. Yeah. Or he says incorporating the technology into the industry. Uh, right now, we can't disclose that. Once we have our um, all our work done, we we're, we're not able to disclose that, uh, and that's something that even the uh, the third party uh, validator does not provide. 
let us disclose. So suffice to say, these are one of the, I think there's two or three of them within the industry. Uh, one, one, so we, when we disclose it, we're, we're happy to kind of provide all the information uh, once we finish all our testing, which is where we are right now. Thank you. We have one final question in the chat here from Daniel. Uh, what makes your business a relatively safe investment for current shareholders? Well, I mean, no, let, let me start by saying that no investment is safe. <laughs> so let, let's start from, from that point. I mean, obviously we're, we're a startup company. We, we do have, a, we have some risks associated with uh, all, our, our, all our products. However, uh, in terms of the lithium processing space uh, and manufacturing, lithium processing manufacturing space, there are very few companies that have a view to revenue and cash flow generation. And ours does have that. So, you know, we intend to be in production early next year that we're, we're working hard to get there. And that provides you with a significant, I would say, base to have a bit more security with our uh, with our company uh, and with our cash flow management, um, I would say, uh, policies in terms of investments and so forth. Uh, so that provides you with more security, a much better investment. And once we start having that revenue, we believe and, and provide the verification that our products are working within a commercial uh, environment. You're going to have you're going to start seeing a lot more. I would, in my in my view, you're going to start seeing a lot more uh, potential business development opportunities pop up. So the first one is the most difficult one, uh, always because it's the first. So you're going to make hopefully we make a lot of mistakes there, uh, not to repeat again. Uh, so when we get that second or Rev2 coming in, it's a much easier uh, development, implementation, and run of the production facility. And as you go into the third and many others, hopefully, then you're going to be a lot more efficient in terms of negotiating the contract, signing the contract, establishing the, 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 uh, the technology that's going to be there. You get them a lot better on it. So that's where we believe our company is a lot, I would say, safer, but, you know, or at least better positioned to succeed in the market. And we have different, we're not, we're diversified in terms of the portfolio of businesses. So we have the midstream recycling opportunity, we have the battery recycling opportunity, we have the lithium refinery opportunity. So if for some reason or another, one of them is not going as well, or is taking longer to develop, then we can potentially work on the other two and so forth. So that is something that is important to have uh, on a diver diversification level. And it's not like we're, that they're very different. Uh, we still have the same people working on, you know, the top technical people are working on all three because it's all lithium chemical um, solutions that we're working for. It's just different types of solutions. So, you know, we always call ourselves the home of lithium science. We're focusing on lithium and that's how we plan to, to continue forth. Uh, so, you know, uh, I don't want to say to anybody that this is a safe investment. Um, is it a safer investment than many other opportunities within the lithium industry? Yes, potentially it is because of the fact that we're going to be in revenue, uh, hopefully, uh, and cash flow generation over the next you know quarter or starting to be in the next quarter, and then building our business there and more diversified product line. Carlos, you addressed many questions today. Thank you. Uh, thank you, everyone that submitted questions. Uh, created a great discussion here. And if you came in a little late, just a reminder that this is being recorded, so it will be available most likely today, but if not, definitely tomorrow. I'll leave it to you, Carlos, for any final last words, though. Thank you very much, Kyle. So again, uh, everybody, thank you very much for uh, jumping on this call to hear a little bit about you know uh, Full Circle Lithium and a summary of what we're trying to do. I, I invite everybody to um, to stay uh, interested within it. We're going to have quite a bit of uh, news releases coming forth over the next uh, few months, and hopefully um, that will lead us to be even more successful. Again, uh, thank you very much. And uh, since today is October 31st, happy Halloween to everybody. Thank you. <laughs>